and uh, a little bit. We had um, slated to begin with RMLD. We're going to move them to second, and we're going to move up the um, the, the uh, elementary school space line item. And you guys might recall at the last meeting, it was the finance forum. At the end, we uh, we had some additional agenda items, and we talked at that time about the potential need for for modulars. And at that time, you'll recall the school committee had not had not voted, so we decided to hold off on that portion until they voted. Um, there's been some updates to the information we heard then. Um, and the school committee immediately prior to this meeting heard that information and took their vote and so what we're going to do here is ask Joe and John and Gail to uh, to provide the update and then uh, we'll address that item and then we'll move on to RMLD. All right. All right. So about five minutes ago um, the school committee voted 5-0 uh, to support um, to recommend uh, to support the uh, recommendation of $1.25 million for um, modular classrooms, um, which pending finance committee support and town meeting support to solve the space issue with Birch Meadow for the 2021 school year. Um, the reason why the number has changed is we've received some additional information since um, when we originally started this discussion a few weeks ago. Uh, there was a memo in the November 6th school committee packet, I don't know if you had a chance to, to see it, that outlined the, um, the reasons at the time for the increase, which I'll have Joe and Gail talk a lot about a little bit more. Since that memo went out, there was actually some even more additional information that really fine-tuned the, uh, the number even more. Um, it, it's our recommendation uh, to move forward uh, for three modular classrooms. Oh, sorry. The three modular classrooms instead of the original plan was for two and to set up the bid in a way that would not penalize us if the bids came in too high. But for the rationale on why that's going to happen, um, I'm going to turn it over to Joe and Gail so they can talk about it in more detail. So, um, just to give everybody a little um, little background, we initially um, were looking at um, building out a uh, classroom on the stage at the Birch Meadow Elementary School uh, and reconfiguring the library space at that particular location um, to gain two classrooms over at Birch Meadow and then also to um, build out the, um, the library uh, about a thousand square feet of the uh, library at the Wood End School to provide a total of three for the need we have. And that rough order of magnitude, I'm going to call it, that we at first look was around $750,000 to do that. Further discussions that we had um, and input from a lot of the people was that there was really no desire to, you know, take the stage away uh, in, the, in the cafetorium divide up the library space um, at Birchie and as well as the same thing up the Wood End School. So at that point, we did some little research and we found that, you know, the modular classroom prices have gone up substantially, but we felt as though we could do two modules at Birch Meadow and build out the uh, Wood End Elementary um, Library for around $750,000. We handed that information over to uh, the cost estimator and they actually came back with a number that was higher and the, um, the modular number wasn't really that much higher, but what was substantially higher is the, is the build out of the Wood End Elementary um, School in the library. Um, it was a chap it's gonna be a chapter 149 project and there was filed sub bids involved in that and that drives the cost up substantially and that number came in at about $1.1 million. So then we took another look at it and we said, how much would it cost? You know, so we came up with three modules and we got a range to provide three modular classrooms at the Birch Meadow Elementary School, which would not impact any of the buildings if it's cleaner that way. We're not giving up space, it's highly desirable. And keep in mind that if you do that and you start dividing up rooms and building walls down the road, it's expensive to go back the other way. It almost becomes a permanent body of building. It, 
we have to make permanent structures. And part of the other discussions that we've had with school committees also becomes equity among all of the elementary schools. If we start taking away libraries and we start taking away stages and we start to try to do other, take away art rooms, take away music rooms, it really makes one elementary school experience completely mm -hmm. different than the other. So for the foreseeable future. So we, um, we had them give a, 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 like I said, the cost estimator came back with a range to provide the modular classrooms um, at the Birch Meadow, which ranged somewhere from $1.1 million on the low side to 1.278 on the high side, which is why it's the 1.25 million to be safe. Um, the modulars that we're talking about adding up there um, would be different looking in terms of instead of rectangular shaped classrooms that are joined together, these would be more, it would, the overall footprint would be a rectangle, it would be three squares with a common corridor that would, when you walk out of the back of that kindergarten wing, you'd walk into a common corridor that would connect all three that would be sitting next to each other. The goal is to structure the bid in a way that um, we would have an adult for the th third modular, and we would design it, um, the architect would design it so that if um, it didn't work out that we couldn't get a third, it would be engineered in a way and designed that we could add a third onto it. But based on what we're hearing, and that, uh, we feel like that cost estimate, we've done other cost estimates, most recently was like Turf 2, they were right on the money with the Turf 2 project, so we feel comfortable with the estimator they're using. Um, the bidding environment is really robust out there, but other towns who have done procured these, uh, the pricing is coming in pretty favorable from the estimates, and we feel like that's a solid number to work with. Um, the other thing is too is over at that location, getting modulars up onto that site would be very is very difficult with the big, the rectangular shaped ones because of the access road and the narrowness of the service road going around one side of the building. Um, we did some, Kevin did some investigating um, on the uh, fire alarm panel and the utilities. DPW has given us great information on the util We know where the site utilities are. We are told that our fire alarm panel can accept more um, zones, which is good, which saves us money. One of the other things we talked about doing is that um, facilities would manage the project in conjunction with the architect, doing some middle review and things like that. Um, to save money on GC markup also. And there would be some work to be done by um, uh, Reading DPW, a small amount of grading that we would also try to do outside of the project. And I think, yeah, we talked about both F and E, how we were gonna handle that, so. So that would be a separate part of the bid process that again, we would take that out separately and we could always look to utilize some of the operating budget to outfit the classrooms if we needed to, depending where the bids come in. So we are structuring it to give ourselves as much flexibility. But we also do feel very comfortable that the three is what the need will be in the very foreseeable future. So in the pricing and economies of scale and the site work and everything to do all three at once versus waiting to try to get additional funding and then restart the process a year from now, and given the lead time to get this done is also part of the overall strategy that we looked at, that ideally if this goes out to bid in early January, it gives us the most flexibility and the ability to get the most respondents. And that's some good learning we probably had with the last module. Yes, which we ended up the last time with, I believe it was a February special town meeting, we actually were not able to start the school year in the modular, so we had classrooms in the Did gymnasium. You? So we're looking to have this be as seamless as possible and then work around the summer schedules with some of the programs that are going on in some of the various cities. And the plan would be to have, if we go with the three, to have three, the three kindergartens sit out in the modulars, very consistent to what we, we, we are doing in the other three schools. And that would allow, us to put the special education rooms and the grade one bubble room um, inside the building um, appropriately. And these are, the, again, the same or similar modulars to the air conditions. 
Yes. Yeah, that, yeah, that's the key. Yeah, 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 right. We're talking about yeah. Right. So, okay, that's about it. Yeah, it's about a thousand square feet. Yeah. Just like them. They do seem to like them. Yeah, yeah. 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 teachers love you. Know, teachers like them. I know they do. I know. That's a benefit. It's a benefit. I think it it's a benefit. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Not, yes. A, not a bad yeah. thing. It does too. Modular yeah. classrooms have come a long yeah. way yeah. since yeah. we had that's the last right. of right. right. Yeah. So, yeah. so, yeah. so, yeah. so just that's that's permanent solution. I mean, how long did the modules last? 20 to 25 years. Uh, tomorrow night's meeting at school committee, we're going to be talking about that. <laughs> Um, there, there's, there's a series of long-range solutions um, that we're going to be discussing tomorrow night. Check with the proposal. I will say this solution does sound like a cleaner solution. When we start breaking up a building and force fitting things, I don't think it's money well spent, and I don't think it's best for the students. So I think this is this is definitely cleaner, yes. and I've heard great feedback too from the modulars yeah. we did get. So, and we are able to preserve portions of the outside space as well, so portions of the blacktop as well as the two, the climbing wall, and then the playground structure would be retained as well. So we would not be giving up all of the outdoor space because I know people will ask from the recess and and whatnot. So there will still be outside space available. So this time around, uh, are they prefabbing these before they burn them and then connecting the engineering them together? Uh, is that the same way they did it last time? Yes. Or, um, so that should eliminate some of the driving schedule, right, on site that is, or in fact on site? Correct. Hopefully, yeah. And yeah. the other ones, because of the size of the, the DOT requirements, that the, part of the issue with the, bringing the bigger ones over the road is they have to get permitted from each state that come through, and they were built in Ohio. And brought out here, and it almost took two weeks to yeah. get them here. Right, that overload. Yeah, right. and it was only certain times a day that you could bring these things over the road. So these are a lot cleaner as far as getting them to us. Right. Um, it doesn't pose any additional security issues as far as building security. Uh, we'll take the same measures uh, that we've done with the other modules. Okay. Yeah, all the other ones are all outfitted the same way the school building is outfitted with the same measures that way but then uh, trending wise it seems like <laughs> uh, I've gotten on the same uh, page as Dan here is um, what is trending show Does trending show that we're gonna need more in two years we're gonna need more space than what we have well what's the house of trending right now so I'm looking at um, your meeting minutes um, from the last meeting and um, the, the need for the third seems almost minimum for two but three is essentially Sounds like it's got to be required. Um, so, at what point? I know you have, we have to use small kind yeah, It's a long range that. plan. Right. <laughs> That's minimum right. three to five years away. Okay, so <laughs> we, we don't foresee the need for excessive or egregious I, space. I never want to say never, right. but the modulars that we put in place five years ago lasted us in our space solutions for five years. And then we're driven primarily by programmatic needs right. special education, preschool and kindergarten. Those are the big three that drive our programmatic needs for space at the elementary. And so, you know, right now, we feel good with the three, okay. but, you know. Which is also why the three yeah. to us makes more sense strategically than the two, because we do know this needs to be. Flexible, just in case, right? I got you. Thank you. So, uh, I know tomorrow's a big meeting, and I've read through that packet, and I you know there's... Do you have all committed to memory yet? Those are the ones um, that made it. <laughs> um, I don't know about committed to memory, but I've got a few of them. Um, leaving aside the specific outcomes there, right, presuming we do something that creates more space, right, um, do you anticipate that these modulars would remain part of the footprint? past, say, five to seven years time frame, whenever those, those solutions come online, or would we look to... So the schemes that you'll see tomorrow night yeah. assume that the modules will no longer be used for classroom need. Okay. That doesn't mean we would want to get rid of them, right. because you never want to get rid of classroom space. Um, there always seems to be a need for classroom space once you get rid of it. So, but the all the plans that you see tomorrow night assume the modules are not part of the equation. So the, so the point would be, 
we would expect to use them for 20 to 25 years, not, not because we are bursting at the seams necessarily and absolutely have to have them for our classroom space, say, seven years from now, but we would expect to be using them. We could be sure. The, like, yeah. I mean, these two issues just happen by coincidence. Right. One is in yep. the drive of the yeah. other. So. I know we're in this awkward situation where we don't want to talk too much about tomorrow's meeting because it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, I get it. Any other questions? Would anybody, I know we just got this tonight, it's hard to listen and read at the same time. Would anyone like to take a few minutes and read through this, or are we okay? This sort of matches what we were just presented. We tried to, that goes into a little bit more detail. We tried to do all well the high Which is why I asked, yeah, 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 yeah. And so this, Bob, this would just be additional money out of free cash. That's what I was just about to ask, because this was this was originally part of Article Three, right? Yeah. Three and four. So you didn't drop a nice little <laughs> final number. For seven Sorry, Karen. Yeah. No, yeah. Bob, do you have recommended words for the to reconsider our vote on Article 3 with the addition of 1.25 million commodity free cash for modular sector. Second. Second. Thank you. Um, so by reconsidering the vote, we voted on Article 390 yeah, last just, time. Just to be clear, this yeah. isn't a funding article. You don't have to worry about the free cash in this one. This is right. just saying this is calculated. Right. Yes. But by reconsidering the vote, is this is this the second vote we're taking on the article, or are we replacing that original vote with this vote? Right? I'm not sure how this. I think we just had one vote. Okay. I think our vote last time excluded the 750. Right. Yeah. It now did. On this vote, we're going to include. include it. Yeah. We're voting on. 1.25 in lieu of the 750. The motion is is for the entire Article Three with with 1.25 in. Okay. All right. Further discussion. All those in favor? Nine zero. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you for the information. Yeah, right. not, we're not done. Four. Article no. four. That's actually that's one. That, that's <laughs> new number of free cash juice. So you have it. It's one million six fifty one seven six five. Seven six. One million six fifty one seven six five. So we're okay. So, so we're reconsidering. So you're reconsidering Article Four, yeah. including the capital you just added and changing the free cash, mm -hmm. as stated. Yeah. So I'll make a motion to reconsider Article Four and support the capital we just supported in Article Three to bring the free cash request up to one million six hundred fifty-one thousand seven hundred sixty-five. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Please keep them up so I can count. Okay. Let's make sure. All right, nine zero. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Now we're done. <laughs> With you. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Joe. Have a good night. Yeah, so before MLD, we'll, we'll handle the, uh, the HR position, yeah. So um, just to rewind for new members, especially a few years ago, uh, through the community priority mechanism, 
the school in the town added an HR general and split it. Um, the, the budget uh, figure was put in the town's budget. Um, but then a certain percent of the time that the individual went down. After three years of trying to work in two places, he was in his mind. He's now an assistant manager somewhere else. Uh, he, he was a great guy and did a great job. And John and I started talking last winter that no matter how good he was, we were still shorthanded at HR. And so we would each like a full-time person instead of each having half. Uh, for the town side, that's simple. We already have that one person in the budget. For the school side, they don't. So what we would like to propose is the schools uh, would like to fund this this year, and they believe they have the resources to do that for part of the year. If you look on page three, I circled the number that was 64 odd thousand. At the last financial forum, I didn't say much about it. There was a $64,000 surplus, but the school committee had not had this discussion with John yet, so I really didn't want to bring it up. But now, if you turn to page uh, four, you see that number of 64,000 down to 4,000. And on page five, it's a $60,000 community priority. Um, so it doesn't cost any more than we've already discussed, but just for clarity's sake, um, you know, we are suggesting that the schools get a $60,000 community priority, which would then move over to their budget uh, after the, when the budget is presented. Uh, and again, we'll each have a full-time HR journalist. And we talked today in HR, that may still not be enough. It's just an intensely busy area with yeah. lots of laws and lots of liability if you don't do it right. So it's, it's tough. It's just literally capacity. Yeah, it, it is. It is. Yeah. And when you have a one person <laughs> role, there's no crossover. There's no if that person's out. <coughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the redundancy issue right now is a we're, we're dealing with it. Yeah. One of the good experiences of having someone shared is I think our HR divisions now are much closer. Mm -hmm. oh, so great. they are more redundant even without these other positions. But that's important. And we would anticipate that that would yeah, that'll stay. Continue. Yeah. continue. That they'll still work very closely. It still just get each group someone physically there. That 60,000 60, will cover that? We feel confident yeah. that it would yeah. give in some of the salary analysis. Yes. Yes. I don't really think it requires a vote. It's just to be transparent. We haven't discussed that before, and now we have. And you said that the person, the person who went off to become assistant mm -hmm. town manager, they were already replaced. No. Oh. Neither the town nor the school. So we're, we're short-handed. Both. You're both short-handed, right? We're both short-handed, right? So both knew. Both hiring will be you. competing. Yes. For that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. They're just looking for something a little different than us. Yeah. But we wanted to try to have these discussions before we started yeah. moving forward and hiring folks without. Yeah. So and then the numbers in here, there are they kind of prorated for the like are they are they do they take that into account or is it just that's just a sixty would be next year's oh, budget yeah. number. So yeah. this year the schools are, if you will, on their own to find yeah. a fraction of a sixty, which they think they can do. So that's all. Good. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you. Now I'm healthy. Is it eight? That's five. Five. We can review the minutes. We, we had. Uh, you guys are looking tired that now, right? Because it's yeah. an open position. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And other members. Thank you, Chuck. So we have to have some people, but we don't have any more than the HRs. Yeah. So it's really, really. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think Colleen is going to project, so you might want to move if you want to move. Hi. Hi. How are you? I have a couple of speakers. Do you want us to? Where would you like to go? Oh, wait, to yeah. see if we can sit together. Right? Yeah, yeah. You want to sit down there? Sure. Maybe at the end. Okay. Are you going to want to project? Yeah. Or you, yeah. yeah. 
one end or the other. Actually, that's good. Hi, Hi. 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 How are you? Good to see you. Yeah, so where, wherever got, you want to do. Want to yeah, we can move down or. Where's Jack? Yeah. yeah. Getting settled. Welcome on behalf of the Finance Committee. Thank you so much for coming in. I know we've been talking about this for a, a little while, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad, glad you were able to make the time and come in. Um, we're, we, we're excited to hear just a, a little bit of an overview, both you know for, about our MLD, both financially, operationally, whatever you've got to, to tell us. I know that that we put out the, the request for questions, and several came back, and 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 I sent those to you as well. So it's best you can address those, but uh, we'll we'll leave it to you. I know there are a few people here. Maybe if you could just everybody introduce themselves, and you could take it. Yeah. So I'm calling up our general manager, and this is Wendy Mockwitz. She's our chief financial officer right. in charge of um, business finance and IT. And this is Chuck Underhill. He's our integrated resource uh, director. And I think you all know what business finance and IT is, but uh, integrated resources is, is a typical division in utilities where your all of your retail and power um, supply comes together, right? So all of your rebates and all of your analysis gets done and then all your power contracts and stuff like that. And, and Chuck's group is, they have a bunch of different uh, specialized engineers that, that make all that happen. So it's kind of what that group does. But if I, I could ask, I mean, the questions kind of came in. I probably should have done this before. Um, they're, they're not sectioned off by, you know, a couple finance, couple, you know, energy efficiency. Can I do them a little bit out of order? You can do it however you'd like to do it. Absolutely, right. yeah. So yeah. I'm going to let Chuck go first. I'll tell you what numbers we're going to go. We just have a couple of slides, but some of it's narrative. And a couple of things I can do. Um, I don't want to, um, you know, I don't want to get into, you know, too much detail to bog down your meeting. Uh, some of the questions, a lot more of the detail is, is in some of the fun uh, detail that I put together for you guys, and I'm happy to actually put this on the website if it if it helps provide a, a mechanism to call me on the phone if you want to ask additional questions, if that's more helpful, okay? So that I'm just not reiterating a lot of things that I, I'll touch on the highlights, but I just don't want to reiterate yeah. completely. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So the first one I was going to ask Chuck to do, because uh, I asked, um, where'd you go? Oh, it went down the other end. I asked, I asked the facilities if Joe Huckins could stay because one of the questions had to do with the coolage and I may have misunderstood the question. So that was, um, sorry, question, um, question number six. So does the RMLD have connections, resources, and expertise to assist the town in setting up a solar garden parking structure or deep energy retrofit like needed at the HVAC coolers? So Chuck's going to answer them most of it, but we were asking if, if Joe could maybe pipe in on, uh, we, we, Chuck and I kind of thought the deep energy retrofit was more of like a geothermal or a, um, a, a ground source heat pump type thing. We're really sure what you what mm -hmm. meant. Yep. I think it would be helpful for Joe to explain what the HVAC work is because there's a big misunderstanding. Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. And then we can and then we can follow up with what we can yep. maybe be able to do to assist. So the the two hundred twenty five thousand dollar number that's in the capital plan for HVAC is when that building was renovated in nineteen ninety nine and two thousand one. The um, it's a, it's a heated, it's a steam heat building, um, and the new section of the building, which was about a 30,000 square foot addition, is um, hydronic, and they have a steam to hot water converter that does the back of the building. So, at a lot of our buildings, since we did the performance contracting initiative back in 2009, we've been going with condensing boilers, and we just did condensing boilers at the Reading Memorial High School. 
So we would actually take that steam to hot water converter out of play and install, I believe it was two condensing boilers to heat the back section of the building, which would save us a tremendous amount of energy rather than running the two steam boilers that we have to provide heat to the back of that location. So that's what that allocation was for, the 225, which the project's actually been already completely designed. So we have a design ready to go. And once the money's available, we will pull the trigger. much that we can do because it's a natural gas fired system. However, if it's a natural gas fired system and you take uh, service from National Grid, then you can apply to MassSave for uh, help and assistance with uh, the financial aspects of the project. Um, we don't do natural gas and therefore natural uh, gas company doesn't come in and do electric. It seems to be a pretty good uh, balance of uh, responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not sure what the term deep, deep energy retrofit uh, means, uh, and it's already been designed as a system. The normal uh, advice that uh, we would give uh, would be where somebody has a gas fired heating system or a propane fired heating system or even an oil fired heating system uh, would be to look at heat pump technology where you can heat and cool down to 30 degrees or so, 30 to 40. Uh, I'm not sure how much the school gets used in the summer, uh, but I suspect the air conditioning load in the school would be very light. Uh, and because it's a hydronic or steam system, uh, you're not going to end up retrofitting with uh, traditional heat pumps. You're going to end up uh, doing mini splits and getting into smaller areas where you don't have to run duct work, but you can run just the piping for it. Uh, so I am glad to uh, speak with uh, the facilities people and uh, take a look to see if there are uh, opportunities. But I think uh, in this instance, most of the, the benefit that you'll be able to derive from the project uh, will come from uh, anything that Mass Save will be able to do on the gas side. Yeah. Just so everybody's aware, when we do our condensing boiler projects, we're going to be getting, I want to say, close to $27,000 rebate coming back from uh, the uh, Mass Save. So you already get Oh, yeah, we okay. fully take advantage of rebates whenever we can on LED lighting, everything. <clears throat> so we're between myself and Kevin, uh, are exploring all those options. We do do LED lighting. Yeah. So. Do you want to yeah. Yeah. Just talk about the solar lighting. So, um, the other part of question six is uh, what uh, do we have for resources to help with solar gardens, parking structures? Uh, outside of the, the work done at, at Coolidge. And uh, I don't know whether anybody in the room made it to the solar workshop that we did about four months ago, but <clears throat> we introduced uh, the concept of Solar Choice 3, which is going to be our third uh, solar garden project, if you will. Uh, we are in the process right now of going through and identifying in each of the four communities uh, where there are uh, appropriate locations, whether it's open space on the ground or rooftops. Uh, we're not uh, sorting between commercial and municipal facilities right now. We're just looking for the best uh, locations in, in which to do this. Uh, we're meeting with uh, a couple of uh, vendors uh, that provide support for the kinds of projects that we were doing. Uh, I had thought, hey, I've come up with this nice, unique concept. First vendor came in and said, oh yeah, we do that in New York all the time. So uh, <clears throat> they're off the list, they're not going any further. <laughs> uh, 
So we, we're launching this. Uh, we will be in, in touch with the, the communities. Uh, the way that this would work most likely for municipals is that uh, we would rent the roofs. Um, the public facilities have a difficult time taking advantage of federal tax credits. So the, the financing for the projects, uh, if a municipal uh, entity wants to do that, gets creative as to who owns it, who gets the tax credits for the first seven years. Um, we're looking at uh, using a lease payment for the roof for 20 years as the way of compensating uh, a municipal entity for participating in the project. So we're, we're looking for creative ways to get the dollars to flow uh, back. Parking structures, uh, we're glad to look at putting panels on the tops of parking structures, but we're not in the business of building the parking structures underneath the panels to get uh, them up two or three stories. So uh, if the canopies exist or if they're part of uh, a going forward project, we would look at incorporating uh, solar uh, onto the canopies and integrating that uh, into the project, finding uh, a home for the energy or looking at it in what we call a power purchase agreement, where we would take uh, the output into uh, RMLD's own energy portfolio. But can I ask a clarifying question? The par parking structure doesn't mean garage. I don't know what the term is for those structures where there's a concrete pillar about the size of a garbage barrel, goes up, it has all solar panels, cars are parking all over. They're all over the place. Um, they're, yeah, they're everywhere. The, the parking structure that's the right that we time. typically uh, consider would be a garage, or uh, if anybody uh, drives further out uh, towards the North Shore, uh, you go to Danvers. Uh, they have put at Danvers Port Yacht Club, they built a canopy uh, over their long term parking area so that. Uh, people who want to park their uh, Jags, their Audis, their Mercedes, their Beamers, uh, and then take their uh, boats out for an extended trip have uh, a covered area that protects the vehicles. So that's what it's called, that canopy? It's, um, it's strictly there for the solar, and the shade is like an added benefit, or I guess it could be a structure. Yeah, we, we would not build the structure okay. to get up in the air and put the panels on. We're glad to come in and look at putting the panels uh, on themselves. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is economic. If I've got an existing structure that I can put solar panels on or I have to build one uh, at significant expense to, to get the panels up in the air, I'm going to opt for the existing structure every time. Uh, that just keeps the cost of the project down and uh, it gives us money to invest in other uh, renewable opportunities or customer programs. That's, um, Andrew, yeah. do you have a question? Yeah. Yes. Um, so the concept that I'm familiar with the concept is similar to the satellite concept, all the cell phone people do the same concept that rent the land from the town and make our shift to our rent for 20 years and they pay a lease. Uh, based upon if it is a solar garden, how would that, and I know I asking loose and base questions, but um, how would that lease kind of um, be monetized? Would that be based upon the square footage of your solar panels? Or, because um, there, there, there are a couple of issues with every roof. One is the productivity of the roof. You know, if it's got 120 foot trees all the way around it, and, uh, doesn't have a good view, it's not worth as much. Um, the square footage is one way to do it, but also if uh, we have to go in and do some make ready work uh, on the roof itself, mm -hmm. that is either not structurally uh, sufficient or there aren't good anchor points uh, for the equipment or something has to be moved to uh, accommodate uh, the panels themselves, uh, that would be taken into account. But uh, we would come up with uh, an appropriate uh, leasing value um, for that, and it, it would, I assume, continue to be arm's length negotiations as to whether 
the town or the commercial customer felt that that was an appropriate uh, compensation for the use of the roof. So, so I asked I asked this mainly because in capital planning uh, with projects that are getting, um, I guess, uh, designed right now, it might be beneficial to reach out and ask if this is an option on those projects for the town. Yes. An option, so that way um, we're talking about cost reduction and, and income, monetary income over time um, on these capital projects. So if you have new buildings or roof renovations going on, make us aware of what those are, uh, and we'll uh, take a look at them. Just, if, I can, if I can just clarify though, so there is a difference between the town um, selecting a vendor, writing an RFP, and building a solar on a municipal roof, and then taking the power from it to service the building, or if they hire a vendor who's going to sell you back the power. Mm -hmm. You can't sell back the power in a municipal franchise. So that's why there's kind of a big difference between us writing the RFP for looking for different buildings. And this Solar Choice 3 that we're doing, we're, we're going to write the RFP where we're looking at all of the different buildings and then we'll be approaching the towns. But if the town wanted to do it itself, it's kind of a different, it's a different, um, completely different type of project when it relates to the RMLD because of that, that home rule, if you will, in order to protect our franchise of not having people come in and take customers or, or people selling outside. Does that make sense? You, you can't have any sale for resale in a, in a municipal franchise. Mm -hmm. Which in some communities you hear about that are not municipals. Yeah, correct. Exactly. So right. that's the yeah. that's your it's choice. Very common. Yeah, you can yeah. do uh, energy choice. You can't do that in, in, mm -hmm. in a franchise. Mm -hmm. So I think Chuck has actually answered uh, question six and seven, which was um, making progress towards the use of renewable energy. Can I ask a general question? Can you power a strategy that says we're going to use condensing boilers and all the schools can it be powered by anything but natural gas and propane? I don't know that they make anything that's electric that's more efficient than natural gas, do they? Electric can't go up against natural no. gas on a cost and of the The problem with these home technology is we, we're talking about buildings that you need to provide reliable in 10 below zero weather. If, it's only, if you're not making good heat at 10 below zero, then we need, we're need shutting schools down. No, I mean, what question? Just to be perfectly blunt. Yeah. No, and, and to be perfectly blunt, the installers out there are not saying 30 degrees. It's like below zero. So I don't know if they're different units when they're commercial grade. So. There, there are two heat pump technologies out now. There's heat pump technology that will serve down to about 30 degrees up to uh, the air conditioning requirement, and, and it just switches. Below 30 degrees, you need an alternate source of heat, whether you put uh, electric space heat uh, in the plenum and, and heat directly through uh, your system, or uh, you keep your natural gas or propane-fired system to operate on really cold days. They do now make cold climate heat pumps that will go down to about 20 below zero, mm -hmm. and you don't need to keep the backup system. They are more expensive. Um, one of the things that also has to be built into a heat pump system, if, you, if you're not just using air conditioning for cooling and your uh, natural gas or uh, propane or oil to heat with, if you, if you use a heat pump to balance in between, you need to put a third control on the system. And that has an outdoor temperature sensor so that it can choose between the heat pump and the backup heating system. So when the temperature drops below 70 and down into that 30 degree range, the system is reading uh, that temperature and making a decision as to which one will work. Um, <coughs> incremental efficiencies on those are tough. It, you're, you're working on very thin margins for, for most of that. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Can you have a quick follow-up on that? You're, you're talking about air source heat pumps, right? As opposed to ground source. That is correct. So what about the ground source heat pump option? Um, <clears throat> ground source heat pump needs to be individually evaluated. Uh, in New England, those tend to be deep wells. Uh, I have a ground source heat pump uh, at, my, at the new house I just bought. 
uh, that you're burning through two pump motors because the well only goes down 136 feet. Uh, ground source heat pumps, uh, in order to uh, function efficiently, need to go down 300 feet plus. So drilling in the northeast for those is a very pricey uh, venture. The other option is to put a horizontal system in. Uh, it lays out much like a septic system, but uh, has to be buried deep so that it's not frosted. Uh, it's very expensive up front. It is a very long, expensive. Long-term operational savings over many decades. Uh, long-term operational is less expensive than a regular heat pump, but it is that up front <coughs> cost. Uh, drilling through the uh, rock mountains that we have here in New England. Neil, there's, there's no commercial uh, solar heating because they do that for residential right now. You put, a so, put essentially pipes underneath a uh, solar panel, you heat the water. I mean, I've seen on this old house, it's not a crazy technology, but there's nothing like that commercialized. Um, there is, it's just the size of the system. Yeah, like so anything on a roof to feed a boiler. Yeah, you, you, can, you can put a neoprene yeah. uh, material down uh, with piping built into it, yep. and it will heat it, and, and, and it will, it's a supplement, it's a preheat for most okay. uh, boiler operated so systems. It won't carry it on Yeah, less fuel, yeah. maybe a little better. Maybe that's the higher. <coughs> We have a slide for number four here. Let me put down some because we're slipping around a little bit. Let's just talk to the slides. We've got ten. We do have to share. We get along. We can share. I wasn't sure. I'm sorry. Here we go. You can pass me one if you want. Okay. Go ahead, Chuck. You could start on four if you'd like. Okay. Get the, the slide up. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure how far into the package it is, but the slide that everybody's looking for is on the screen behind me. Um, <laughs> So that makes that a little bit easier. The, the question that we were asked is, what do the savings for solar look like? Uh, so uh, we took uh, from some work that we had done uh, a calculation of the uh, typical residential bill uh, pre-solar system. And uh, that bill under current rates is about $1,641 uh, a year. Uh, when we put solar on, there are two impacts. One, uh, a portion of the bill is reduced when the solar uh, produces energy at the time that uh, the customer is using it. And the second is when there's excess energy, there's a payment that is received by the customer. Uh, those two incorporated together uh, bring the customer's uh, bill down to $877 a year. So the net savings to a solar customer uh, is $764 a year. So Chuck, you're, you're talking about like if a customer has their solar panels on their house. Yes. Like this, is, this is just an individual versus like your solar program or anything like that. Yeah. That, this, that's separate. This would, this this would be system. for a typical residential right. customer. Okay. Um, commercial is a little more complicated, uh, but the system scales up or down in size. Uh, commercial happens to have a uh, demand component to the rate that uh, can be affected by solar, uh, depending on what the customer is doing uh, throughout the day. But uh, typical savings are about $764 a year uh, for the uh, residential customer. About 12 panels at 300 plus, but just tell me how we're changing. Okay. So, we uh, were asked to look at the equity and fairness. People were having uh, a difficult time uh, understanding why we were charging more for what we were delivering and giving a, a lower credit back. So what we're looking at, and um, it's going to take uh, a policy uh, change as a, as a new tariff uh, from the commission. Uh, yes, there you <laughs> um, but we're, we're looking at going to um, a model that is becoming much more widespread with municipal utilities in Massachusetts, 
we will have a customer charge in the rate. Uh, we will have what's called a facilities charge, which is how we get compensated for the distribution system that you're connected to that moves the energy off of your system when it's excess, brings it back at 2 o'clock in the morning when you'd like to keep things in the refrigerator cold. Nobody wants to uh, suffer that. So uh, we will collect a, a facilities charge, and then we will go to uh, an in and out rate that is the same. So instead of being the 15 and a half cents, it would probably be in the nine to 10 cent range, which is what the cost of power itself is. But we would just do that as a swap in and out. So you would see that we're buying the, the energy from you at the same price that we're selling it to you for. And we think that that's a, a much simpler, more straightforward model uh, to work with in pricing. We can't do a straight net meter like some of the islands used to because they they're not collecting to pay for their poles and wires. So right now it's about 15 cents to you get charged and you get about four and a half cents back when you sell the power back. So this would be nine cents in, nine cents out, then a customer charge that pays for your service to your house, and then a facility charge that pays from the transformer serving your house to the rest of the trans uh, distribution system. So that's what we're working on for, for a new rate tariff, just to explain. Is it going to be like a variable, um, those two charges, or fixed, or and every customer which gets Which charge more? going to be variable? Uh, the facilities and the service. The, the facilities charge will be based on the size of the solar system that's installed. So it will be a fixed charge variable by customer. Okay. The energy charge will be set probably once a year. <clears throat> and reviewed as our wholesale costs evolve. Is that a per kilowatt or how does that Per connect? kilowatt hour. That is yes. per kilowatt. So this new rate structure will only apply to the solar system? That is correct. Okay, so while I get this next slide up, um, I'll we'll go to Chuck. Uh, um, number three with Chuck so I can load the next slide in for uh, yeah and while we do this so did Joe did you have a question or no no okay and then um, the, the, I wonder if it might make it however you want to do it at some point um, up to number one is kind of more high level and that we can certainly go down into the details we need to so maybe that might be helpful as well um, but I do appreciate what I've heard so far because I have solar panels on my roof so th <laughs> yeah no yeah we'll finish that and then we could then go to the the high level then yeah, yeah. so uh, okay no rush just yeah. It's fascinating stuff. I'm loving yeah. this. Huh? It's fascinating. I'm loving this. Um, I do have an opening in <laughs> okay. I am a position for projects coordinator. Who would then have to go out and sell all of this to the municipalities, the commercial customers, and the residential customers in four communities? Um, so question number three, what kinds of projects could our MLD partner on in Reading um, and achieve the goal of increasing the use of renewable energy. Um, I did modify the answer a little bit to be both renewable energy and uh, energy efficiency because I get a 100% reduction uh, in carbon emissions for every kilowatt hour I don't produce. And I uh, am big on reducing carbon. So including um, that, uh, this is kind of a broad question. The, the short answer is very simple. Any of the efficiency and electrification programs that we offer uh, will fit with uh, the municipality and what it's doing. So whether we're going through and evaluating the efficiency and doing lighting retrofits uh, in municipal facilities, uh, whether we are uh, looking at alternative energy such as solar uh, or possibly a cogen project, uh, with micro turbines uh, on natural gas uh, in facilities. Um, and um, we're working now to develop uh, new programs uh, industry wide. They are referred to as electrification, 
we look at it as switching the fuel sources in transportation and building on below heating. Transportation, we're looking at converting from uh, gasoline and diesel powered vehicles to electric vehicles. And the commission has made a commitment uh, as a policy. Uh, I have been directed that as we add electric vehicles, uh, we will make sure that we add uh, enough non-carbon emitting resources uh, to our portfolio to be able to serve those. It doesn't make any sense to take a carbon pr uh, producing vehicle off the road and charge it with electricity that's coming from carbon producing resources. So uh, we're, we're moving and I'm not terribly worried because we've been buying more non-carbon resources uh, in our portfolio. Uh, then we've got electric vehicles and HVAC systems coming in. But the commitment is that as we add uh, conversions, converted load from transportation sector and from the building envelope sector uh, to our portfolio, we will serve that load with non-carbon resources. So that's our... And by the second quarter of 2020, the towns can elect uh, the new retail green pricing, which means that you can elect uh, to in increments of how you want your power purchased. So um, we used to have green choice and uh, we're retooling that so you can say we want half of the power that we buy to be green and, and we will buy that for you and we can set up those types of pricing uh, and we're rolling that out the, the second quarter of 2020. So we'll, we'll be sending out some information on that. Do you want to go to slide 11? My last slide. Pretty much. Okay. Um, I talked about what we were doing with the portfolio. Um, we put together a slide. Uh, it is up on the board. Uh, it's also in the packet. Uh, this is what I have been using to kind of lay out uh, the policy issues that we're facing. Uh, where the playing field is going and what I need to know in order to make rational decisions about resource acquisition uh, in RMLD service territory. So just very quickly, um, there are three lines on this graph. There's a green one, there's a red one, and a yellow one. The green one, uh, and I get a lot of pushback on even having it there, is the old renewable portfolio standard, uh, it is part of the statute, it still exists, it has been superseded. But that was the original uh, goal, it was targeted at renewable resources. The new goal is the red line. That is what the IOUs are working towards now. It is the clean energy standard, which means it comes from non-carbon. So it doesn't have to be a renewable resource, it has to be non-carbon. That is a much steeper uh, slope. It starts higher up, and this line is intended to be 80% of the resource portfolios uh, of the investor-owned utilities by 2050. The yellow line is a line that the 41 municipal light plants in Massachusetts uh, have proposed and is currently in a bill uh, in front of the legislature. Uh, it starts out uh, a little lower. There are some municipal utilities that uh, don't have quite the uh, renewable portfolios uh, out there like RMLD does. Um, but very quickly, uh, we have a uh, steeper slope uh, until 2030 when we catch up and then we will match uh, the investor-owned utility. So this is a plan to give enough runway to the other municipal utilities in the Commonwealth to get uh, on board with. And it's based on clean energy. There are some quid pro quos that we're working with the legislature on. I know quid pro quo is the dangerous <laughs> thing. Um, they are not bribes, however. Uh, one of the things that's important is we made investments historically, based on the playing field that was in place at the time. Things that we didn't have to commit to, we found ways to evolve our portfolio while still uh, keeping costs as low as possible. 
And if you take a look at what some of these uh, colored bar areas are, the lighter blue is currently under contract the solar, wind, and hydro resources for RMLD going forward to 2040. Okay, that is the lighter blue line down at the bottom. The darker blue line in the middle is our nuclear portfolio. It is non-carbon. We want it to count. It's achieving the non-carbon goals. Are you telling us that we have to get rid of that and put in another resource? Um, so the legislation says we can meet that yellow line but we want our nuclear commitments to count. So those two are what we have going forward as a non-carbon portfolio. The solar, wind, and hydro, and the nuclear. The darker blue line above it, those are contracts that we are currently negotiating. Those contracts also include the renewable energy certificates, or RECs that are a huge political argument right now. With those in the project, those uh, are currently under negotiation. That will raise uh, components in our portfolio in some of the middle years up to about 50% non-carbon in the portfolio. And you will notice that we are uh, up through 2028 uh, just with our committed resources right now above uh, the line that uh, the municipal utilities are looking to commit to with the legislature. Add in what we're negotiating and we go to 2030. Uh, and we're still without doing anything else above it. So we've got a good story to tell at RMLD. Um, and we've got uh, some breathing room for us to make careful decisions about projects that are out there. We don't have to buy projects that are marginally economical. We don't have to buy into projects uh, that have a greater risk of performance uh, or some other uh, issues associated with them. So it gives us the luxury of picking and choosing. It also allows us to now devote resources to some of the other uh, opportunities that we have to mitigate carbon in our uh, portfolio, including bringing the load down or converting it to uh, convert, converting it from uh, carbon-driven vehicles to uh, electric vehicles. Um, so uh, we think this this gives us uh, quite a bit of flexibility going forward. Here, however, is the big issue. Planning horizons for power supply portfolios. Minimum is usually about five years. The light dotted area that you see there is open portfolio for us. We can buy it in the market if we want, or we can secure other resources. You'll notice that we start to have large open sections of our portfolio in two months. That's not five years. This is why we are pushing hard with the legislature to get them to give us a playing field, to find the rules so we know how to play the game. And I'm on a very tight runway. For the, for the next two years, I'm looking at probably buying bilateral contracts to fix the price risk that we have and do the planning uh, going forward uh, for, for other opportunities. So, is this taking into account reductions in electricity demand just based <coughs> on conservation efforts? This, this is an energy chart, right? But we do have factored in what we're doing with uh, demand reductions, the battery project uh, that we have going on, yep. uh, shifts in load as we bring electric vehicles on. We're looking at charging programs that will keep them off our peak. But how about just residential folks like myself who are putting in LEDs, so I'm using less electricity than I was the day before. Yes, that's so kind of, that, that, that is factored in. factored into yeah. the, the, the requirements. This, this okay. is, yeah, this is factored in. So general conservation. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand. 
I'm just going to go quick a couple, not like number seven, sister communities. Um, the only thing that the other communities are really doing is they have some economic development um, committees, and in North Reading, we're actually sit on that committee. Um, we're hoping to get on Wilmington's committee, and if Reading has one and Linfield, we'd like to sit on those as well, because I think we have a lot of um, technical knowledge to offer, um, a lot of programs that we can, if we, we don't have the replay program, we can analyze it and, and possibly come up with something. Once we do that, it has to be a benefit to the ratepayers, and then we can offer it to everyone in that class structure. So that's kind of number seven. Um, number eight, um, the question is about the green communities. Um, the RMLD has looked at opportunities to work with green communities and is currently exploring potential access to the Reggie funds, which was the Exxon spills, and the VW, which was the emissions um, funds, uh, and working cooperatively uh, in ventures with green communities. Under the statute, uh, there is if there's one national grid customer within the RMLD service territory, and that's all four towns, then each of the towns individually could join green communities. Now, here's where the rub is. Um, you know, the way I look at it is, you know, we, this municipality deserves to get money back from Reggie and the VW funds, but we do not pay into the rest of the funds that green communities are using. And so at some point, people like National Grid and stuff that are dumping money into their MTC funds and stuff will say, hey, why is one customer in the RMLD allowing all four towns to tap into that? We want them to start paying. So my concern with that, and why Chuck has been working really hard and the director lives in Linfield, is to try to come up with something where, instead of having a perpetual membership, that we can tap into the monies that we're paying into, but not get ourselves into a situation where they may implement a charge that the RMLD will have no control over, but the towns will have to pay. So I don't know if that helps to explain the difference. It's a little different, like the town manager from Linfield used to live in Melrose, and they're a national grid, so they were able to tap into a lot of things. So if you're interested in certain projects, we can talk to Chuck, and we can see if we can't get that Reggie money out and, and the VW money out. We did get some EV charging out of, uh, grant money out of the VW. So hopefully that kind of explains where that lands. Quick and dirty, I guess. One quick question. Um, um, sure. Um, I guess... Do all of the RMLDs, I know you said they can join individually, but do all of the RMLD towns have to agree that they're all going to join? Oh, no. so Reddy can say yes, Correct. regardless of what anybody else yeah. does. Okay, cool. Thanks. Right. That's correct. Right. Okay. Yeah, sure. okay. Uh, jump into number nine, just really quick. Uh, we're working on a fleet transition program. We're having a little bit of a hard time just trying to finish up RMLDs because a lot of um, utility vehicles like pickup trucks and stuff, they're just not coming out yet. They may be out at the end of next year. We actually had XXL from Boston come in, and they actually retrofit things like UPS trucks and stuff where there are these massive batteries that cost between fifteen dollars and $25,000 a piece to put into like an F-150 truck, anything from 2005 and above. They assist the drivetrain, and so they actually give you better gas mileage, but overall the money's not there. But the whole industry and the vehicles is skipping over plug-in plug -in hybrids um, and really just trying to go to all electric. And so that's why there's been kind of a gap in these cars coming out. So we're very interested in seeing, you know, the all-wheel drive SUVs that we can put our engineers in, that they can respond during snowstorms and stuff, and pick up trucks that some of the general foremen and stuff like that. When we get that ready, which we're hoping we'll do soon, when these truck starts coming out, we'll start developing the fleet transition program that we'll, we'll not only offer to the municipals, but also to a lot of our large customers that have probably more than five or more cars or trucks. Um, right now we're offering charging stations. Just so that you understand the concept of the charging station, we use charge points. Not to be confused with Volta, which is uh, allowing, and it doesn't, it doesn't impact the home rule, the franchise, believe it or not, um, but they show advertisements, and they're typically stuck in little mini malls and the electricity is free, and it's actually the customers that are in that mall are paying for the electricity. And the, and the state has decided that's not a home rule problem. But the charge point ones for four different areas, like public parking on in the public lot, or public parking in a private lot, we have four different scenarios that we're looking at. 
one of them would be fleets like behind the gate, almost like the gas pump, where you would want to have uh, a charging station that has controls on it so you can see how much the car is charging, what's the maintenance cost, and you can track all those type of things. So that's, that's actually up and coming. Um, one charging station, just to let you know, like the one in RMLD, you have a charge point head with the software for one year. If you were to dig the underground up to 50 feet, include the transformer, that would run about $20,000. Just to kind of get your head wrapped around like what one dual charging station would cost. So um, hopefully that kind of answers the question. But it's a little bit because of the vehicle technology, but stay tuned. I think we'll be able to give a better presentation on the type of fleet transition next year. Thank you. Is, that, is that something that, you know, like when you get to that point, so obviously you have your own vehicles, the town has their own vehicles. Is there, and, and, and all four communities have their, obviously their own vehicles, is there any, you know, kind of possibility that like you can pull that? I mean, obviously they all have their own schedules as far as what they're doing, but is there is there any, you know. Aggregation? They, yeah. Yeah, a lot of towns have looked at aggregation in the past. The problem runs into, uh, you have different priorities. Sure. You know, we're servicing four towns. North Reading also wants us to build a mini RMLD in North Reading to make sure that they have their appropriated number of trucks in that town. So you, you get into that, you know, a car comes into the shop, what gets fixed, the fire truck or the electric truck? So aggregation is good in a lot of ways. We use it in buying power. We use it a lot of ways, but there are some things that just don't work out as well as what you would think they would be. But it's a it's a very good question. The other thing that I missed is uh, we're targeting buses. So if you've gone down to Washington, D.C., you can see there's electric buses that are clone around. We'd love to be able to target school buses. I know that they're privately owned in North Reading. And to also look at those as some kind of a battery storage, we could, we could offload the battery for additional peak shaving, because everybody knows that the price of electricity during peak usage is, is very high. The biggest problem with electric vehicles that a lot of people don't look at, it, and, and we talked about this the other night with Senator Lewis, and Karen was there, um, from the electric system standpoint, when one Tesla comes on, it's like four houses coming on. So when you think about that, think about that transformer that's servicing you and five of your neighbors. And you know, I'm running out there on a hot summer night trying to replace a fuse because the transformer went down. We are collecting through meter, meter data management in our outage management system the analytics to see who has electric vehicles so that we can come up with programs to say, okay, you need to really charge between 9 and 11. You need to program your time between, you know, so that we are not um, failing these transformers because these transformers cost $1,000 to $5,000 a piece. So, you know, we have to have that whole load management intact without physically going into people's homes and controlling their appliances, which is not always a good idea. And some municipals have done that until the EV charger didn't work and the guy didn't get to work and then all of a sudden, you know, nobody's you know, going into people's homes. So, so, so is that, is that, so that's a, that's a project that's under, like, under where you're saying, so how is that, I have, I have four plugins. Yeah. And I, and like, I have solar panels, well, I'm, I'm the, I'm the green guy, so. Yeah. But like, so. But I'm conscious of that, but not. I don't have the education to know like when's the right time, when's the night time. Like, how's that going to get? Well, we're going to roll that out. This okay. meter data management analytics is going to allow us to see all the, the EVs and come up with programs. Like right now, we just rolled out uh, a residential where we'll give you a free charger up to seven hundred and fifty dollars. But I give you the goat, you're going to give me some chickens, right? So you're going to sign up for the time of, time of use rate sure. so that I can put you on a rate so that myself and the commissioners can kind of monitor and make sure that electric vehicles are not creating another peak, okay? And we're not overloading the transformers, right? And in addition to that, you're going to give me the analytics, but we're going to, we're going to get them anyways because Electric vehicle usages, when you're looking at graphs, you can tell the difference between that usage and a different appliance, believe it or not, it's kind of magic. But yep. does that answer that question? It okay, does. Great. Are you in the Shred the Peak program? Yes. And yeah. you get an alert telling you what the period not to charge is. Yeah. I, I, I was right. more like thinking just more specifically to charge in, you know, charging right. a car versus just yeah. turn off the AC. That, that's you know. the one time that it's really bad. Yeah. Right. The, just to give you an idea, an e-gallon is about $1.20 versus a gallon of gas is about right now 279 
We have one uh, electric vehicle bolt right now. Obviously, it's pretty brand new. It's 2018. We use it to go around and collect the bills and, and pick up all the, the drop boxes and stuff. Um, no maintenance so far. The battery will probably need to be replaced within five years, probably around five to six thousand dollars. Um, so, so far, so good. We don't really have a lot of analytics just on one car, but again, as they start to roll up next year and we start to evaluate them, we'll report back and, and give you some more data so we can uh, help out with that complete transition. Great, did that one. Um, okay, so we can go back to page one. So uh, my opening statement, other than introducing everybody, was to say, because I, I was kind of reading between the lines on some of your questions, in addition to that, uh, you know, deep dive I did on the um, on the funds. Um, just understanding the difference between a municipal, uh, like a city and a town, and a, and a municipal life plan. Uh, the RMLD operates as a business entity under Mass General Laws, Chapter 164. While it is considered a subset of the municipal government, it nevertheless faces different operating and capital risk from those of the typical city and town. In addition to long-term debt, it counts its contractual commitments, all of those power supply commitments and contracts that we have, um, as obligations that must be reported in audits and is considered as part of its financial health. The need for reserves to support operations in the event of interruption of revenue streams must take financial and contractual commitments into account as well as the day-to-day -day costs of maintaining electric service as a critical infrastructure. The RMLD operating objectives strive to maintain the lowest level of retail rates while meeting policy goals of the Board of Commissioners and the constraints it faces in the industry environment in which it operates. So that, I'm just trying to give you kind of an overview of what the difference is. So um, we'll, we, we can jump right into Wendy. She's going to go with three slides very quickly. Um, on number one. Hi, good evening. My stuff is not nearly as uh, exciting as trucks, but I'm right. all the sure yeah. <laughs> everybody wants to hear about cash. So um, well, we are numbers people. <laughs> yes, exactly. So uh, the question was talking about the financial relationship between RMLD and the town and um, the financial inter interdependencies like pension, OPEC, health insurance, and cash deposits. So I did a, a flow chart, which I also had presented at the um, the select board meeting, and I'm not going to go through it because it's very uh, involved, but what the gist of the message here is that the RMLD has no check writing capabilities whatsoever. Um, we cannot physically touch cash outside of petty cash and counter cash that comes in. The town of Reading writes all our checks, uh, makes sure all our wires get you know uh, sent out as requested by us, and but the, the message is the level, and if you look at this flow chart, and we'll be happy to send you this entire um, um, slideshow, the level of complexity of the receiving the invoice in the door and actually sending the check out the door, and the amount of manager approvals between uh, everyone inside RMLD, the commissioners, and then of course the town looks at everything. It's pretty involved. So I mean, we, we really are crossing our uh, and dying our eyes. So the same thing for the payroll side of things. I, another um, chart just goes over the fact of flow of how we actually um, track hours at the RMLD and uh, we, have, we have operations folks, we have business folks, so there's some differences there with uh, work orders. It is a cost, um, cost accounting type of a business. So you can look at that and you can see the uh, complexities there as well and the approval process that it would go through. Okay, so then the actual uh, question about the interdependencies of open and pension, once again, we we, uh, we share the actuary with the town of Reading, and uh, they, of course, produce this report, and based on where we want to be and what we're considered to be fully funding and the years and, and all that goes into it, and I'm not qualified to do that, but uh, the, the point of it is, we take that actuarial report and we go based on the recommendations and we fund the OPEB and the pension that way. The, the OPEB currently is not, in the, it's, it's town treasurer, it acts as the custodian. We're in the works uh, with uh, Sharon to change that up and, and 
re renew that with the commission, and the pension uh, also has a separate fund by itself. So the any kind of interest that we make on the OPEP, the pension, and some of the restricted funds, depreciation, customer, sir, um, customer, um, what's what I'm looking for? Their um, customer deposit. Thank you. Customer deposits, sick buyback, <laughs> and rate stabilization. All that <coughs> stays with the Reading Municipal Life Department, and it just gets uh, reinvested into the fund itself. <coughs> Any other kind of um, interest that comes through operating funds, that stays with the town of Reading. The RMLD does not get that interest. <coughs> Health insurance, again, we uh, we also are taking part of the town uh, benefits, so health insurance is one of them. So we pay the town for the health insurance. We take out the money out of the employees' paychecks, and uh, you know, it's, it's all, it's very, it's very involved, but at the same time, it's not that, it's not that big a deal. Um, this other page on cash goes through all the different possible scenarios of what we uh, deal with day to day on a uh, cash basis with the Town of Reading and County Department. We we are always in contact with the Town of Reading and County, it's mostly by email, because that's just the way of business today, but uh, daily emails back and forth, whether it's wiring or um, our bank deposits, <clears throat> any kind of Anything. We do a lot with, with the uh, county department. So then we'll jump to, um, uh, I don't know what question it is, but. Can I, can I ask you? Um, yes, take care. Um, and, and maybe this is a calling question. Just So we have a bunch of new members, and we don't do this every day. But um, so if you're new in town, you're, you're told that um, the town of Reading owns RMLD. Uh, is kind of responsible for for some ways, and then the other thing is that there's an annual payment, and I saw one payment referenced as an administrative payment. Is that different than the payment, like like yes. like literally? Okay, yeah, that's different. kind of like for, for services. Oh, services. Yeah, that's services. The check writing, the um, the accountants. You know, the services. Okay. The percentage of what they are utilized for the RMLD resources. So could you guys just remind us, like, so we're the finance committee, what money does RMLD contractually owe the town? Um, we already know Bob's told us, like, we, we have liabilities because we, we own RMLD. So if you guys start blowing up all those other towns, probably Bob won't be happy. Well, but you don't do this, we only have good. a liability that the RMLD is <laughs> going to go bankrupt. Right. And that just doesn't happen. So um, that too. Yeah, and so we stopped the, delivering the power. monies that go in are, as Wendy said, the operating, um, all the operating interest goes to support services, money goes through, and then there's the town payment that goes through below the line town payment in addition to the 2% of net plan above the line. Can you talk? Yeah, exactly. That's it. Can you, um, like, pretend like, you're like, hey, you guys might want to know about this outside the line. Yes, right. thank the line. you. Exactly. Um, I didn't really <laughs> um, prepare for a payment discussion, we're actually going to be having one, I think, the first week of December. We'd like you all to come, but generally, uh, it, a below-the-line payment of the rule of taxes under Massachusetts General Law 164 is a voluntary payment, and most municipals set up uh, a, a pretty much a standard formula or whatever that we'll talk about that we pay, you pay the town that, that hosts you uh, only. Um, but this particular, because there's four uh, communities that we serve. It's a 20-year agreement. Uh, Wilmington actually has uh, almost 60% of the load. Uh, Reading is more like 20%. Um, so Reading gets, uh, right now, it's $2.48 million each year till the end of 2020. Uh, we, we, the study is completed, and we're, again, we're going to be having that meeting in the uh, first week of December as soon as our budget's finished, and I guess you guys have some uh, select board meetings that we're trying to work around. Um, and then above the line, uh, it was a special legislation because most pilots are voluntary and they're below the line. But to keep, I guess, essentially the best way to say it is Wilmington, Wilmington from seceding from the union since they were the largest load and you want to protect that golden egg. Um, they were, everyone was assigned to splitting 2% of net plant by load. So the, so essentially uh, Wilmington gets about $800,000 in 
You don't have the numbers right off the top of your head. Um, right, so everyone gets 2%. Everyone gets 2% of the net plant by load. So mm -hmm. you it's get 2%, 2 Pro rate. Of the 20%, right, exactly. Yeah. And, I, and I have all those sheets. I just. So net plant is $78 million, and 2% uh, comes out to just under $1.6 million, and then it gets split. So that's above the line. Yeah, so what's, sorry, the line I'm getting? Yeah, what I mean, and it's an expense. Oh. It's, it's not below the line, meaning it's not, it doesn't come out of our Probably. ability, Probably. ability yeah. to make up to 8% of our net. Mm -hmm. Correct. So does that, does that help? Yeah, if you come to the meeting, I think we'll... It, I can just it, add some, yeah. just to make sure if anyone understands. From uh, the town's perspective, in some things, RMLD is like an enterprise fund, like water, sewer, storm water, and RMLD. Um, they pay a certain percent of my salary, a lot more of Sharon's salary, and so forth, like the enterprise funds do, and she referred to that as a, a charge for service. Oh, uh, yes, quotes are direct costs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you see that as a revenue, because that's a revenue, because our salaries are fully in the budget, so that money comes in as a revenue to help support it. Um, in terms of things like health insurance, when I got here, they were paying an estimated cost because no one could figure it out. Um, over a couple of years of being here, they now pay exactly what they owe for their specific employees. And generally speaking, I was trying to think of the things we pool, and it might be, I don't know, liability or workers' comp. There's a couple things we pool together, but not very much. Mostly you're paying for the things that you need to pay for, and we're paying for the things we need to pay for. There's only one or two things that we might pool together in terms of we're, we're all paying a share. One of us might have a good year, one of us might have a bad year in the long run it works out. But just so it's clear, they are paying exactly what they owe for all these shares of pension and OPEP. For their basic own. expenses that we're covering. Right. right. Yeah. And then the only other thing is like the, in the interest on the operating fund, which I, we have no idea what that is. Because it's, yeah. it's money coming in and out, it might be $20 million a month because we write so many checks, but whatever that is, we don't. Because um, I don't think, like, I, I could be wrong, but tell me if I am. I don't think that select board is going to be like, hey, here's how, here's how RMLD and uh, you guys will be discussing, you know, what the above and the below line payments might be versus, like, why they are and what, what payments there are between the two entities. That's kind of what I was asking about to just try to understand. Uh, <laughs> I might have done it in a different way, like, 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 what well, I wrote down everything you said. I'm, I'm not sure I get the full picture. I think you came at it from one angle. I don't know if anybody else. Maybe I, I actually, I mean, even though the new study hasn't been um, issued yet, yep. the study that I did in 2018, it takes you from soup to nuts and explains everything. So if you would like Is it me on to the website? send you, okay. It might be on the website. If you'd like me to send you a copy, that might be um, really I helpful. certainly can do that. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, that kind of explains everything. Okay. I think all of the questions, except support services, we don't get to go into that on that. But the above the line, the below the line. Okay. Do you mind sending it to um, Eric? Yeah, sure. Just send it to us? Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So then I, um, I uh, believe 13. Question 13. So I just prepared a few slides. Uh, some of the questions were, you know, to show uh, what is the five-year trend by month of cash. So um, I did that one. And for, you know, we accrue a lot of expenses, and of course we um, we accrue revenue. And at the end of the year, everything has to be trued up. So these cash balances in by month. It's not necessarily a good indicator of how we're doing because there's a lot of timing. But at the end of the year, you really want to make sure that everything's tied down exactly the way it is. So I don't measure by month. I may talk about it in uh, the commission meeting just so they kind of have a feel for where we are. But at the end of the year is really where we we're really are with cash. And you guys so are in a calendar year now, right? We are. We okay. had a transition. We did a six month, uh, 7 1 to 12 31 2018. And then. Um, now we are on a calendar year. We're in our first full calendar year. Okay, so um, 13 talks about unrestricted cash balance approximately 21 million. Unfortunately, that's incorrect simply because we didn't make the transfer to capital in time before the, um, the um, auditors finalized their, their 
audit. So uh, of that 21 million, 2.5 came out and went to the uh, construction fund for the sake of capital improvement. So it really ended up being 18.3 million, just so you know. So moving to the next slide is a good indicator of where we are, uh, cash to operating expenses. So uh, everybody's asked, you know, what's the standard? So Melanson Heath, who's the auditors, and uh, the town shares the same auditors. Um, they, we've asked, we asked them a few years ago, what's a good indicator, what's you know, um, a good balance to have? And they said, industry standard is three months of your operating and maintenance costs. So uh, as you can see, starting in FY14, we're down at 1.6 months, basically, of you know, costs. So if anything goes wrong, we're not very secure. And when we think about our rate payers, we have to be you know, um, financially responsible with the funds. So we have purposely, been um, increasing the cash so that it gets to a point where we feel comfortable. You know, the commission is on, our, on side with this. So we like 2.5, you know, we're not, we're not trying necessarily to reach the three months, but 2.5 is a very uh, good feeling, basically, that you know that if something were to happen, you have enough money to operate the business. Okay? Thank you. Um, yep. Sure. The next, uh, everybody likes the pie chart. So the next slide is a, like pie. It's a lovely pie chart, lots of colors. And it basically just goes through our, all of our cash funds and what's sitting in it, so, and, and the percent of cash that's in it. So $52 million, but a lot, most of that $52 million is reserved. And, and it's reserved simply means that. You cannot, we cannot touch it outside of what it is reserved for. So I mean, you can, go, you can go. You can see well, how all the um, the cash balances are uh, what they're for specifically. Uh, the next slide seems to be a eye catcher as well. It, t it tells a good story. This is our capital funds and. Uh, one of the questions basically was asking us, you know, what are your um, inflows and outflows? And specifically relating to capital, this uh, speaks volumes. So whatever is left over for uh, in the depreciation fund is reserved specifically for capital projects. We cannot touch that money. So we just carry it over to the next year to the next capital uh, improvement schedule. So that's the blue. Then you have your depreciation. So the DPU says, you have to reserve 3% of your gross plant for uh, capital projects. So we, you know, you can elect other, but it's not, it's not, um, yeah, the minimum is 3%. 3%, so, what was it, plant? Gross plant, yep. gross plant. So, and that has to be spent only on capital projects. You cannot use it for anything else. So then you have your operating fund transfers. Now a lot of uh, mines go into this operating fund transfers. It's part of our strategic plan. It's part of our you know six-year plan that we present with our budget uh, the past I don't know four or five years. Colleen has presented a six-year plan as well as just a regular yearly budget. So you know we're strategically thinking all the time of what exactly is coming is coming up. What exactly we're we going to need to replace. And there's been a lot of a lot of things that have come up, and of course, uh, a lot of talk of the substation in Wilmington. So we are strategically trying to get to a point where we can fund that substation. So if, if you're looking at the fund balance and you're saying, well, you know, if you look at FY19, half a year, it's a little bit, um, you really can't tell a story about half a year, but still, if you look at it and, and you're saying, okay, well, you got this money in there and you only spent 2.4 million, why? Well, we're preparing for, you know, 13 million, 13 million. So we're trying to get to that point. We don't want to. We don't want to have the balance come under what it at least two million dollars. We would like it to stay at the three percent of, of gross degree, of gross plan. But you know, yep. So I got a question. So, <laughs> so we don't have these cash reserves like you do on the municipal side, but Bob leverages the capital markets a lot. Um, what? They don't borrow. Yes, you have no debt. I was like, okay, so that's a very different financial model. So that was one of the things I was hoping you might talk to us. Cause yeah, that's one of the questions. Yeah. Oh, so it's a different one. Okay, okay, sorry. Okay, let me just finish up here with this. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that capital uh, funds spreadsheet tells a good story, just so you understand. We're continuously investing 
more in our capital infrastructure than we actually are reserved, we have a reserve for. Okay? So then your deferred fuel uh, reserve, it's uh, the, the department transfers the difference between the customer's monthly fuel charge adjustment and the actual fuel cost into this account to be used in the event of a sudden increase in fuel cost. So um, Chuck's group does a really good job of trying to decide what really should be sitting in that deferred fuel. So you will see a fluctuation based on the market and how, it, how it's doing. I'll get into a little bit more detail on that. I'm gonna go jump to number two. Um, still trying to figure out which ones were considered the meat, all right? Were, we're considered what? You said get to the ones that were the meat, and I, did I, did I say that? Yeah, you did. So I, I was like, okay, I don't know which one. We can do finance 101. They're all important. I thought that was my name. I know, they're, just, they're all important to me. Yeah, I don't yeah. know what he's saying. I don't know what he's saying. That's a big that's a big number for your food fuel, but you don't hedge your fuel costs at all. Like it's pre buy on the market, so you can like eighty percent something. I, uh, just, that seems funny to me with this type of number, you don't hedge at all. We do hedge. Okay. We hedge about ninety five percent of our portfolio. Oh wow. Okay. okay. Um, we have one unit that is fuel oil and natural gas driven. Okay. And that's the, the Stony Brook project in London. The rest are bilateral contracts. They are fixed price, fixed quantity, delivery schedule. Okay. And so with that, the, the, the price is fixed. Um, and that's 90 to 95% of the buy. Which is So you got, you're not you're not looking like you, you guys do, you don't have like a consultant looking at fuel costs and, and telling you when no, to yeah. buy. You're saying you're locking in based on Well I'm I'm looking at the portfolio. Okay. And and you're right. So I'm I'm okay. a consultant essentially. Okay. We have a risk mitigation strategy. They before I got there they used to buy power. In that slide that Chuck showed you we have a lot open. Yeah. That's typically not where we would be. Okay. And that has to do with the state deciding on uh, the uh, clean energy standard, you know what I mean? Because oh, typically so those will be filled in, right? So you don't know what you need. Right. Well, we know what we need. <laughs> we just want them to make a decision quickly so we can lock in the while source. the prices are still low. The, the source of but we have, so they used to buy power once a year. I'm not sure quite what day it was, but once a year they would buy. And to me, that's not a risk mitigation. So we set up what's called a TFA. We, we now purchase on four year average pricing and we buy in tranches based on, you know what I mean? So we have a, yeah. we don't like to call it hedging because we never want to say we're hedging um, public funds. Um, so it's risk mitigation strategy. And, and we, we do the TFA and it, it's actually a, a quite effective way of purchasing power uh, and to address. But right, you're using the peaks because of that, like you said, you're, you don't know well, we, you're gonna, yeah, you're but gonna have to be at a certain point right. because of open legislation. Yeah, but as we're going through each day, and you're talking about peaks during the day. No, I'm saying peaks in your fuel. Like if okay. you look, you'd say if you're buying, you would smooth that out, right? You would, you would be. But that's form. part of what the rate stabilization in the fuel reserve is for, is to stabilize the rates so you don't have that. Because weather can change things. One generator shutting down can mess up the whole entire ISO stacking for the market purchases for the day ahead okay. because we're, we're trading in commodities on a daily basis. So even though we have contracts that were locked in, yes. we generally have pieces that are in the open. Like typically a portfolio for a utility would have about 17 to 21% open depending on what time of year. Yeah. And so we have, it's, it's a mega strategy, um, you know, Excel spreadsheets that we're always doing the analysis, but to try to make it simple, we're using the tranches to try to explain it um, of, of how we purchase and how we, we make sure that it gets locked in. Because, you know, we could let everything ride into the market and say, oh, well, it's always going to be cheaper. But you're going to have that one day where the cost is going to go from $40 up to 8000 because you had Seabrook and Millstone shut down coincidentally, and you're going to be in deep trouble. And when that happens, especially in November, you know, people think, oh, well, maybe that'll cost $100,000. we are talking 2 or $3 million. 
like that. So it, it's Sorry. it's Sorry. it's big it's okay. big bucks. Yeah. And that's not the kind of thing they don't do like insurance products or anything else we, to help you. We're actually that. doing a little bit of rider pilot on top of this, where some utilities will buy yes. like it's almost like a premium insurance. It's called a load following, and we're kind of giving that a try. Mm -hmm. But we're actually our TFA risk mitigation is actually working better. But we've tried. When I changed it, we, we've tried three different um, processes, and, and actually the one that I've been using for a long time, and Chuck and I have used uh, in the past, works quite well for keeping ready one of the lowest uh, rates in the state. So it works well, and it's based on full year averaging pricing, and it, um, it just works really well. What is the timing or status of the legislation to help you know when you'll be able to store where you'll well, source those gas from. Just actually, That's an excellent question. question. Do you have the answer? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Last, uh, two weeks ago Friday, we, we met with um, the Honorable Representative Brad Jones and, uh, and Senator Tarr, and all the GMs from all of uh, the North Shore met to go over that to see what was happening. A lot of these bills get stuffed together, and we're hoping that there's going to be some kind of an energy bill that comes out. Uh, we're really pushing for that. Um, a lot of people think that, you know, municipals were given an exemption. Um, I know MCAN likes to think that stuff, but a lot of those were because during deregulation in 1998, the IOUs had to sell off all the generation. So they buy every six months, and then they reconcile and, and increase their rate to recover their cost of production. Municipals were allowed to keep all of their old contracts because their long term contracts because all of the customers paid that. It's one of the reasons why, in the renewable, we want to take credit for that um, as carbon free because that was the whole point of it. It wasn't especially supposed to be okay, we want a windmill that costs a really lot of money to build and maintain when really the concept is supposed to be eliminating carbon. So, I don't know if that helped. It did. Okay, good. Okay, so on number two, um, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm trying to get through these quick pieces. Please. Uh, how do we make a decision about borrowing um, uh, capital to finance major projects? So, again, the RMLB utilizes a risk mitigation strategy when determining financial planning for its capital projects. The tool of bonding would be best utilized when all other constraints of operating an electric company are lessened. The strategy involves having an ongoing analysis of all of these constraints, such as fuel pricing, capacity pricing, uh, transmission pricing, prior, prioritization of capital improvements, meaning are we talking about stuff that's nice to have and it's, you know, we're going to build it in 10 years and it's great, or are we talking about a substation that could fail at any moment? You know what I mean? So you have to evaluate what it is that you're trying to target in your capital. So that was the other question um, kind of had to in my household, whether there's so we could have something massive fail in town too, and we don't have reserves sitting around, so we would go and borrow debt to meet that day. Like, like anything that, I don't even know what a timeline, I know if your timeline for planning a new substation seems to be really long, I don't know what a, well, a time plan factory yeah, replacing one the is. Planning for the substation is not that long, we just, the land that we purchased ended up at the last minute after two years, not belonging to National Grid, it belongs to the town of Bloomington. And it's an Article 97. Yeah. And if we lose that substation, you know, it's not like the Wilmington substation serves Wilmington. Yeah. Actually, the substation in Reading serves our largest customer in analog in Wilmington. It's the way you look at the service territory electric is you're positioning your substations to balance yeah. your load and to make sure that you have proper contingency feeding when, when feeders go up. So, but I think I'm going to answer your question when we. When, when we um, that um, uh, cost of money comes into consideration, limitation on committed power resources, meaning all of those contracts that we already bought. Um, and let's see, since the RMLD can only borrow through general obligation, okay, we, we can't get a letter of credit, we can't get any of that. Um, and even the president of the town, right? Just to just no, so you, can borrow, you can borrow on revenues. You're not, you wouldn't get our credit rating on the cost general. I was told that we can only borrow general obligation bonds. You, you probably only want to do that, but there, there's no. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll double check on that. Then. Okay. 
Um, but given the present condition of the RMLD service system infrastructure, the RMLD operates mostly as a cash business. Currently, because of the long-term absence of system maintenance over 30 years and predicted failure of significant plan, the RMLD determined that increasing the rate of return during lower fuel pricing constraints periods to allow for construction fund transfers to rebuild the system was a more prudent direction. Obtaining cash quickly to address the critical failing equipment as delineated in the six-year plan. In addition, at present, the industry trends in the costs associated with the development of renewable projects and the closing of major generators like Pilgrim and, and other large systems that are feeding the end of the pipeline, this general area, um, bonding would create substantial compounded obligations for the customers during a period of what we're considering predicted pr pricing volatility going forward. In essence, historically low borrowing rates, as you indicated in your um, question, are a factor in choosing bonding. But historically low fuel pricing and predicted future constraints in a volatile electric market makes the strategy chosen by the RMLD a more immediate, cost-effective, and rate stability cost solution to bulk short-term electric infrastructure. So I understand what you're saying about why you would choose to bond. And you're saying, wow, it's really low interest rates. We're looking at so many other components with balancing the electric and considering all of those constraints that I added. That's why we chose that. It's not that we would never choose bonding. Mm -hmm. It's just given the situation right now. Um, and, and like I said, I, I can't answer exactly why you, don't, you can't have that. Because one of your questions is, um, like number 13, are there unique reserve rules that are different from how a municipal operates? And that's kind of similar to question 12, where there is the unique financial regulatory requirements that a municipal like Reading does not have as it pertains to cash reserves and debts. Um, the only way I can really answer that is the municipal life plant financing is governed by MGL 164, which, which is just not applicable to cities and towns. So there's, there's a completely different level of financing for that quasi-enterprise, uh, but quasi-business that allows the recovery cost of production and for us to have to take into consideration all of those the debt obligations that we have with all of these entitlements and contracts. You know, we're, we're thinking of bonding small projects, but we have, we have these huge debts that come into play with all of the power contracts that are all purchased in order to provide power going forward. You know, everything that was in that chart is all paid for. They're, they're not paid for, but they're all under debt um, as, as we pay them, pay them off. Does that make a little sense or under yeah, contract? It, we are completely different in this yeah. regard. One of the simplest ways to think of it is we have a much harder revenue cap on us than they do. So we don't have options that they have. Uh, right. It's really two different businesses, if you will. They also have more fluctuation in capacity, capacity of in and out than, of every, than we yeah. ever yeah. Right. You know, so their ability to commit to these contracts is uh, I want to say it's easier because it's more difficult for you guys to go for it, but um, they have the kind of monetary flexibility in order to do that because of the daily internet versus our I Reading, town Reading does not have that. Um, question number 10, you know, I, I don't want to read everything that I wrote because, again, it's a lot of it is answered in this in this memo that I said I would post. And, um, but the long story short is, you know, the depreciation fund is by statute applicable to, to mass um, municipal light plants. And as, the, as the Wendy said, an annual expense of a minimum 3% cost of plant reserve is required. Um, we could, uh, you know, what was it, the, we utilize a construction fund to meet long-term capital improvement in lieu of an annual increase in depreciation expense. So meaning that we could, as an alternative, I'm not sure what the benefit would be, other than it would be an above-the-line expense, instead of doing a 3% depreciation to fund these capitals, we could just send a letter to the Department of Public Utilities and just say, we're going to go to 5 or we're going to go to 7 because we, we have to, because 3 is just the minimum. But instead of doing that, we just bumped up our rate of return for 
five years, and then we're going to go back down to what's considered a normalized, which is typically between a four and a half to a six percent rate of return. Is typically where you would be, so that you are not um, you're utilizing ratepayer money for what's it, what it's intended. You're making your town payment, and that's it, because we are essentially a not-for-profit. So you have to justify why you're lifting it up and why it's coming back down, and it has to go into the right funds, and it has to be appropriated for the right things within the law. Okay? So I won't go through those, um, but you ask the funds that the RMLD uh, have are typical for electric utilities. Most utilities have a rate stabilization. Um, every utility has a depreciation by the Department of Public Utilities. Um, and the deferred the de fuel on reserve, for example, what? is that is that um, is that pretty standard as well? Which one? The deferred fuel reserve. Deferred fuel reserve. They may call it something differently. Like in Danvers, they call it the PPFA. We call it the PPCT. But it's the same type of thing, because essentially you're projecting forward, okay, of what you think this. So the way it kind of works in simplistic terms is, is you have a rate, okay? But then what the, the DPU allows is you to have this rider on top of it so that you have a buffer zone. And that rider, every month we project ahead and then we reconcile back to make sure that it comes out perfect every single month. Because if your rate was flat, you, you don't ha you're not like an IOU, but you can just say, okay, well, we're going to charge 23 cents, and then at the end of the year, you say, oh, I guess we should have charged 29, so we're just going to have this huge rate hike. We, we can't do that. We, we actually have to recover it. And some utility cover recovers it monthly. Some of them may extend it out depending on what happens. So let's say Seabrook shut down, and it cost us an extra $1.2 million. We may decide to dampen that out over three months, but we have other volatilities that we may decide to collect in the PPCT in that month. Does that seem like an easy way to try to explain it? Okay. Um, so the depreciation fund is targeted at no less than the depreciation expense, uh, according to a recent study that basically said for our size, and not in the situation we're in right now, which we're basically trying to rebuild the entire system, but on a normal level, when we get to that level of maintaining, projected to be probably in another six or seven years, we should be at a level maintained about $8 million a year for capital infrastructure is what a system this size for four towns should be spending in order to stay up to date in compliance with OSHA and, and National Electric Safety Code standards. So that so was, done, eight by, million that was a actually year. done by a third party. Okay. Yes, when you get to the level of maintained. Right now you're seeing a couple of 13 millions because you know, the substation alone is going to cost 11 million. You know what I mean? so, Um, so I just wanted to add the excellent S&P rating of the RMLD along with the financial audit demonstrate and supports the appropriate funding. Just remember that too much or too little can adversely impact the rating. And why the rating is so important for us is because when we buy power supply, that rating, even though it's a credit rating, it goes to how well a, like a contract we're going to get. You know what I mean? We don't have to put up extra money. We don't have to have all of these things, to, like collateral and stuff. We come on really good, and we get really good pricing, and that's how we're able to keep, <coughs> keep, the, keep the rates low. I, I think I got all of them. <laughs> Did I talk way too fast? You talk pretty fast. <laughs> well, you know you can always email me if you think of something we can listen that fast. have a, uh, <laughs> an additional question, but it is kind of a lot to, to do yeah. in a small little meeting. It's, you know, even when we hire new people, it, it actually takes months to train them on, on the cohesiveness and the holistic of sure. how it all works together and how this side, you know, changes something that affects this side, you know, so it's... I applaud you all that you're all at least looking at me like I, I got most of what was said. So that's some. I guess that's I'm fitting it well then. Because <laughs> it is I a totally different business going. model. So yeah, it's hard to wrap your mind around it. And the constraints yeah. and the options and the flexibilities and the risks are really very different. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But if you think yeah. of something like specific that's something that we talked about that you maybe like the next time for us, I mean, other than we're going to talk to you about EVs and that type of stuff when that comes done. but. If there's something that we talked about that you want us to take a deep dive into 
on that particular thing and spend some time explaining it, we're more than happy to put that together. We, we really are, um, you know, very much willing to be transparent. We, yeah. we we're, we're not that keep the, the knowledge in. We try to do that with the employees. We want everyone, just like our kids, to be smarter than us, <laughs> so that when we leave and we retire and left in a better place. So. We really do think if, if everyone's educated on it, then it's, it's easier to have a conversation about what's happening. Yeah, I appreciate that, Colleen. I think today was, you know, to, to tonight to go over all this was was helpful there's a lot here um, and we digested <laughs> different parts of it definitely but maybe a next step to this could be kind of a deeper dive in, into like a one specific area so we well, can it was all great yeah, questions yeah, actually yeah, i thought they were very yeah, good yeah very good. Well, and i was very happy that he was i think to joe Huggins for staying yeah yeah no, thank you, Colleen, Chuck, and Wendy, for your for your time tonight and coming in. I really do appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the spender. <laughs> right. Thirteen million. That's me. <laughs> There's our deep dive next time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. All right. Any other questions from anybody tonight? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we do have minutes. Yep. Just one second. Yeah, one set. From the. Uh, the firing squad. You thought it was fire Oh no, I'm yeah. used to auditors. No, yeah, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the auditors are tough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, minutes from uh, the 16th. That was the finance forum. I'll make a motion to accept the minutes from the 16th. A second. It looks good. No, I'm no we're okay. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Further discussion? All those in favor? Awesome minutes. Awesome any other comments, questions, business from anybody? I'm not sure when our next meeting is. I'll have to look. I'll send out an email. Hmm? Oh, we're posted. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, come as you can. Okay. Motion? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? 9 0, thank you. Thanks, everybody.